Ever wonder what Christianity was like under the apostles? Here's Tony Bosserman to give you a glimpse into original Christianity. Autophagy. It's all the rage in dieting circles these days. Auto meaning self and phagy meaning eating. It's literally self-eating induced by fasting. And it results in our bodies cleansing themselves of all those damaged cells and revitalizing our good cells. And it happens at night as we sleep naturally to a limited degree because we don't eat anything until the morning. And that's why the first meal of the day is called breakfast, because we're literally breaking a fast. So according to research, autophagy kicks into a little higher gear when we fast for more than 17 hours. And that's why intermittent fasting, which is eating all of your meals in a 7-hour period of time in a 24-hour period, is so popular among weight loss enthusiasts. It really does help them lose weight and keep their weight under control. So dry fasting, which is going without food and water for prolonged periods of times, can triple the effectiveness of cell repair and the discarding of those damaged cells. The benefits of autophagy? Well, it slows the aging process. It, of course, helps some people lose weight. And it can prevent chronic diseases from forming in our bodies. In fact, according to research that's published in the International Journal of Molecular Science, autophagy can strengthen our bodies against metabolic disorders like diabetes, certain cancers, and neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And exercise is another means by which we can induce the autophagy process in our bodies. So how does autophagy work? Well, according to Roberta Gottlieb, an MD at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, she says, quote, essentially a membrane forms around materials within the cells that has been marked for disposal. It encases that material in a membrane and then delivers it to the lysosome, which is full of digestive enzymes that can break down the cargo. So in today's edition of Original Christianity, we're going to talk about both the physical and spiritual benefits of fasting. Let's begin in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, where Solomon says, I know that nothing is better for them, mankind, than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all their labor. It is the gift of God. So part of the blessings or fruit of success, of working hard, is being able to eat whatever, whenever we want to. And of course, people that are well off, some of them can even afford to hire a chef in their homes to you know, prepare all of those beautiful dishes that they like. And so actors and actresses that have that kind of money you know, also then have to watch what they eat to some degree, because, of course, if they don't, they might lose their looks, their figure. It makes them so appealing on the screen. And so Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 10, a worker is worthy of his food. And so we're not anti-food here. Nobody should be. Food is a great thing, and we need it, and we need healthy food in order to stay healthy. But periodic fasting can be very beneficial to us, both physically and spiritually. In Philippians 3, verse 18, it says, For many walk, of whom I have told you, Paul speaking, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. And so sometimes our belly can become our God. And of course, we've all been guilty of this, overeating, overdrinking. You know, it's called gluttony, isn't it? It's condemned in the pages of your Bible. And so is drunkenness. So fasting can actually help us get those cravings a little bit under control. And so fasting can be a good thing in terms of self-discipline. Now, it says in the book of Proverbs 23, For the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty. And so, you know, people that overeat and overdrink, 
you know, usually don't have a lot of discipline, and so they come to poverty anyway because, you know, discipline is not part of their thinking and their character and their nature. And so it shows up in their work ethic as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Paul goes on to say, Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So think of athletes, you know, many of them very successful, make millions of dollars, and so they can pretty much eat whatever they want. They go to fancy restaurants, and yet they too must show discipline in what they eat, when they eat, and how they eat if they want to keep their performances at top levels. And so whether they're a football player or a runner or a basketball player, they have to watch what they eat. And again, for them, too, it is good to fast on a regular basis in order to kick in autophagy and, you know, be able to cleanse their cells in their bodies, those damaged ones. So in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, it says, When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. And going back to those athletes, you know, sometimes when a team wins a World Series or, you know, the Super Bowl, they're invited to the White House. It's like coming before a king, isn't it? And so, you know, most people, when they're in that kind of setting, are going to do what it says here in Proverbs and kind of check their appetite and make sure, you know, that they're handling the uh, silverware properly, that they're not eating too quickly, they're not smacking with their mouths. You know, it's something that um, is part of etiquette when you come before prominent figures like the President of the United States, or again, uh, maybe even a mayor or a governor of a state. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11, verse 4, it says, Now the mixed multitude who were among them, among Israel, and remember they came out of Egypt with even some of those who were Egyptians. Well, they yielded to intense craving, and we all do from time to time. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. And so a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people. And the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. And so he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava because there they buried the people who had yielded to craving. And so again, fasting helps us to kind of regulate our appetite, doesn't it? It helps us to put it in check. It helps us to you know, be able to subdue those cravings and so that we're not overeating or only eating junk food. And so cravings are something that are part of every human experience, aren't they? We have them all, almost every day. And again, it is a matter of discipline, and this is where some of the spiritual element comes in, because as we yield to God's Spirit and say no to overeating or overdrinking, well, we're actually growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So cravings, it's just a natural part of being a human being, and fasting can help you put those in check. So everybody has to figure out what works for them the best. You know, I try to fast once a month, the first Monday of the month, and it's usually just a water fast. I do, you know, still drink, but I go without food. 
but it helps me to kick into autophagy to a certain degree. And it reminds me of the fact that, uh, you know, I shouldn't just be eating and drinking all the time. And then I need to give my body and the digestion process, you know, a little break from time to time, clean out your colon, etc. In the book of Isaiah 66, it says, For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So this is speaking to the return of Christ, if you read the whole context of Isaiah 66. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse, shall be consumed together, says the Lord. You know, isn't it interesting that God gave a tree, you know, that to the fruit of which he told Adam and Eve they could not eat. In other words, he barred one tree. But, you know, Satan got to them and convinced them that if they ate of it, they would be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, God has given us certain meats that we can eat, and it's described in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy 14, if you'd like to read and study it. And so that is our tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God's basically saying, are you going to eat what I tell you to eat, or are you going to eat what you crave for? And many people, of course, crave for the shrimp and the crab, or kind of the disposals of the bottom of the sea, or again, pig, which eats you know, a lot of leftovers and things that are thrown out and isn't really good for you, as studies show. And so God says that he's going to punish with fire and slay those with the sword who eat such abominable things. And so again, this too is part of putting in check our cravings. In the book of Job 23, verse 12, it says, I, Job, have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Well, is that you? Do you, you know, keep your cravings in check? And of course, according to God's commandment and instruction, and do you crave better food more often? Christians need to imitate Job and keep the commandments of God, which include refraining from eating certain meats. And the book of Deuteronomy 8 verse 10 says, When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. And so we should ask God's blessing upon the food that we eat and remember that everything that we have comes from him. So what are the benefits of spiritual fasting? Well, they are many and they're detailed in the pages of your Bible. Christ spoke about them and, of course, many others. So we'll cover that right after this. No one would deny that a major part of the COVID-19 effect has been to bring an eerie silence over the earth throughout much of 2020. Empty streets, business offices, churches, schools, stadiums and parks, with billions of people sheltering in place, have dramatically lowered the decibel level generated by human beings throughout the world. Another part of the COVID-19 effect has been to greatly curb people's activity levels, resulting in an unparalleled, restful state in cities and countries everywhere. In retrospect, the year 2020 may be dubbed the year the Earth stood still. What most people are not aware of is that this COVID-19 effect was foretold in advance over 2,500 years ago, and it is the first of eight major events to come. It was all revealed by the most accurate political forecaster in the history of mankind. Read Foretold and find out what's coming after the COVID-19 effect. To order your copy of Foretold the COVID-19 effect, visit OriginalChristianityReview.com or find us on Amazon. We've been talking about the physical benefits of fasting. And we've seen that, of course, fasting for prolonged periods of time can put us into autophagy. And that enables our cells to actually repair themselves and revitalize our good cells while discarding all of those damaged and dying cells. But is that the only reason we should fast? In order to revitalize our cells? In order to lose weight? Or in order to prevent certain chronic diseases from forming in our bodies? Well, no, there's also spiritual benefits to fasting. And we're going to go over those in just a moment. But first, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23, where God gives us a festival that involves fasting. 
It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month, which is in the autumn, shall be the day of atonement. You may know it as Yom Kippur. It shall be a holy convocation, which means a commanded assembly of worship, for you. You shall afflict your souls, which means to fast, and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. So once a year, all of the nation of Israel gathered together on the tenth day of the seventh month, and they worshiped God, and they were fasting. They were going without food and water for 24 hours. And this helped them physically, but it also helped them spiritually to draw closer to God, to think about spiritual things. You know, during the time that we fix meals and clean up afterwards, you know, we can take that time when we're fasting and actually devote it to God and prayer and Bible study and thinking on his word. So fasting can be a very good spiritual exercise. And we read about the details of what a good fast is and what a bad fast is in the 58th chapter of Isaiah, where it says, Is it a fast that I have chosen, God says, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread the sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and speaking wickedness. So here God contrasts wrong fasting with right fasting. The scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus chided many times because when they fasted, they made sure everybody knew about it. And, you know, they would bow down their heads and they look real weak and miserable, of course. And then everybody knew they were fasting. You know, Jesus said, if you're going to fast, you know, do it, uh, you know, privately, do it quietly, you know, go ahead and uh, get up in the morning and uh, wash your hair and dress normally and look normally and make it look like you're not fasting because it's something between you and God. And so that's wrong fasting. But right fasting involves a change of the heart, loosening the bonds of wickedness. And so it's a good time when you're fasting to make a little list of some of the things that you need to work on in your relationship with God, maybe your mate, your children, maybe the people you work with, your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, these are things that we need to review from time to time to see how we're doing. And fasting is a really good time to do it because you're not eating, you have plenty of time, and you need to fill that time with some kind of endeavor. So we can analyze ourselves and try to loosen the bonds of wickedness. You know, if you happen to be enslaved to drugs, alcohol, or pornography, then fasting can help you to loose those bonds of wickedness. So fasting is something we should gauge in on a regular basis, and it should result in us asking some tough questions. Are we inviting you know, those who are less fortunate into our homes? Are we sharing our food? Are we trying to clothe those who don't have enough clothing? This is the kind of fasting that the Bible talks about should result in change. Now, in Second Chronicles chapter 20, it says, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea from Syria. And Jehoshaphat, who was king of Judah at the time, feared and he set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim to fast throughout all Judah. So from time to time, national leaders have called fasts. You know, Abraham Lincoln did in this country during the Civil War. 
And so during the Civil War, we had a call for fasting and prayer so that our nation could be healed. And then God heard that prayer, and the nation was eventually healed. Now, it took a while, but it did happen. And so various kings of Israel and of Judah on occasion would call a national day of fasting beyond the Day of Atonement in order to get people returning to God Almighty. In the book of Ezra 8 and verse 21, it says, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. You know, maybe you're facing a tough decision. You know, should I move? Should I take this job? Should I quit my job? You know, we can fast and then we can pray for God's guidance that he would cause us to do the right thing for us because we don't always know what that is. And so often, you know, when I'm fasting, I will bring up to God a decision that I have to make and ask that he will not only give me wisdom to make that decision, but that he would guide the decision and it would be the right one. In the book of Esther, you know the story. A certain decree went out of genocide against the Jewish people, and it was brought to Esther's attention. And so she says in Esther 4, verse 16, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish." So she was willing to put her life on the line to prevent genocide of the Israeli people while they were in Persia. And so, you know, fasting, again, can, you know, give us access to God in such a way that he hears our prayer. Remember the example of Jonah? He goes to Nineveh and, you know, he cries out in 40 days, God is going to destroy this city. Well, what happened? From the king right on down, all of them fasted. When we show God that we're serious about change in our lives, God sees and he hears and he takes notice. In the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 21, it says, However, this kind of demon, is what Christ is speaking of, does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And so many times over the centuries, individuals have been troubled by demons. We read about it, of course, in the Gospels. And Jesus is saying that, you know, if you really want to be involved in casting out a demon out of someone, well, sometimes it involves prayer and fasting and drawing so close to God that he then hears your prayer for this person and they then have this demon cast out of them. In the book of Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, it says, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so before we ordain an individual, we are to pray and fast. And so, you know, you lay hands on an individual, you're putting them into an office of deacon or of elder, described, of course, in Titus 3 and 1 Timothy 3. And it is a very solemn occasion. And so God doesn't want us to do it flippantly. And so it involves praying and fasting for guidance so that we lay hands on the right person at the right time in their lives. Now, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and verse 25, it says, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the cleansing of the church involves primarily the Word of God, because the more we look into the Word of God and try to line up with it, the more cleansed we become of all that is wrong in this world. But fasting also helps us to do this, as we've seen. 
So in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confession, as they say, is good for the soul. And it does result in a kind of cleansing spiritually, just like reading the word cleanses us. And fasting, if it's done properly, can help us cleanse ourselves of all the impurities in our hearts and our minds. In Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 30, Nehemiah says, Thus I have cleansed them of everything pagan. And so, you know, he had to go through the process of cleansing the people of Israel from the influence of paganism. Remember, they'd spent 70 years in a foreign country, in a foreign land, Babylon, and that had taken its toll on the people. And so here he is talking about cleansing them of everything pagan. Have you done so? Are there no no pagan practices or influences in your life? Well, it's a tough question for every Christian to ask themselves. In the book of Revelation 3.16, it says, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I, Christ, will vomit you out of my mouth. And so we read about the parable of the ten virgins. You know, they're all asleep right before the return of Jesus Christ. You know, it's easy to get lukewarm just because in a long period of time, as we try to live by God's word, sometimes we, you know, kind of get off track, don't we? And so we can't be lukewarm or God's going to spit us out of his mouth. We've got to be passionate for his word. We've got to learn it, we've got to live it, and we've got to lecture it and share it with other people. And so God has called us to do just that. In the book of Joel, chapter 2, and verse 12, it says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. And so, you know, that's a good instruction. We need to turn to God with fasting, with prayer, with weeping, with mourning. It is something we should do on a regular basis. So I encourage you to go to our website and order our booklet, Original Christianity. It's hot off the press. And you can go to the bookstore at our website, originalchristianityreview.com, and you can order a copy of it. And I talk a little bit about fasting in there. And so it will also help you to understand what the original church practiced and believed, because that's what we're to practice and believe. So remember, if original Christianity was good enough for Jesus and the disciples, it should be good enough for you and me. Get your copy of Original Christianity by going to originalchristianityreview.com. And thanks for watching.